are the guest. Hey, everybody, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. Happy New Year. Welcome to the very first show of the year. Thank you so much for watching. Last year, I did 365 shows, didn't take a day off, and we are kicking off the new year with a superstar. He is here to give a brand new lecture, a two-part lecture, the first today and the next Part two will be a week from today at the exact time, 9 a.m. Pacific time, right here on my YouTube channel, Chef AJ, none other than Dr. John McDougall, and he will be talking about protein, and we are so honored to have him here. Happy New Year, and welcome, Dr. McDougall. Well, thank you. You know, this, this protein lecture has really been delayed a lot. I, I did the potato lecture first, because I wasn't quite a rhetoric to get around to doing the protein lecture, and I give this protein lecture today as a challenge to me you know, to see whether or not I'm ready. I certainly would like to have your comments, you know, your questions, your concerns, uh, anywhere that I let you down as far as this lecture goes, just like you did with the potato lecture. I made so many improvements in the potato lecture thanks to your comments. So I'm looking forward to the same thing happening this time is, uh, you know, if you see things you like, you think see things I'm missing, you'll let me know. Let's see what's going on. Before I get into the protein lecture, which Heather has, Heather, our daughter who runs the, uh, 12 day McDougal program has been bugging me to do dad why don't you do the protein lecture and like now uh, besides the protein lecture what else is going on well we're sold out AJ which is good we're sold out for the um, the next 12 day program and that's uh, we take a maximum of uh, about 40 people and we're way beyond that and we're getting into February and March right now so <clears throat> I think that says something about the acceptance of a telemedicine telemarketing program worldwide uh, for the McDougall program. You know, it's really been really positive for the staff, as you well know. You know, we've talked about a lot here. And, and your comments, AJ, about how good the year has been in terms of you communicating with people over 2020. I mean, you know, the pandemic has certainly been a disaster in many ways and will continue to be a disaster, but it's brought on new forms of communication. And of course, you know, that is with what you're doing to help people, AJ, and what we're doing in the McDougall program with our telemedicine telehealth program. Uh, you probably know that my passion, my passions have gone beyond solving chronic diseases like heart disease, diabetes, obesity, constipation, and digestion, and so on. You know that I've spent 44 years dealing with the science, uh, dealing with 12,000 patients. And I have to say, I'm pretty settled in how uh, patients should be taken care of. You know, I'm pretty settled on what's wrong with you and how to get it fixed. I'd have to just make a blank statement that 80% of the people I'm talking to right now, and these are followers, 80% of the people I'm talking to right now either realize or will realize the fact that they are suffering from food poisoning. And it's just a matter of getting the food fixed. And I don't care whether you, uh, you know, are fighting with your spouse, uh, your kids left home, uh, you're all having all kinds of financial problems. I don't care what's wrong with you. You fix the food, you'll fix your health problems and your personal appearance problems. Well over 80% of the cases. Well, I have to say, AJ, you know, in my elderly years, you know, I've been called elderly recently. I guess that's a compliment. In my elderly years, I've uh, focused my attention uh, toward different things. As many people, many people for, I'm sure, millions of years have done, when you get to a certain age, you, you uh, focus on the future generations. And uh, since my first grandson was born 17 years ago, I've been focused on what in the world I could do to help cool down this planet, to help save planet Earth, to help save our home. What can I do? Well, what do we know? And I include you in this, AJ, this, in this responsibility. What do we know better than anybody else knows? And that's food. And we have the diet that has the best chance of cooling down the planet. I've told you that you know, over half the greenhouse gases are due to what we eat and switching to a vegan diet could result in an 80% reduction in greenhouse gases overnight. It has been said that even if we solve the transportation and the energy problems, unless we fix the food problem on this planet, we will perish. Oh, what a responsibility. And I take it seriously. I mean, if I can just add this little drop of knowledge, it's this little crack I can make in the, in the wall of ignorance about the food that we should eat to be healthy, the food we should eat to be kind to the planet, to be kind to animals. 
if I can make this little contribution, it's in a starch-based diet. It's got to be starch-based. You're not going to save the world on broccoli or kale. You're going to save it on rice, corn, and potatoes. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Rice, corn, and potatoes. Well, in my effort to take and kind of punch my way into the future, and believe me, I plan on going screaming and hollering, punching and kicking. I'm uh, starting the first, the first conference, which will be January 9th, 2021. The first conference on how a vegan diet will save humanity. If you could think of a better title, you let me know between now and then and I'll change the title. But I want people to look at what we're doing and I want them to be shocked that we suggest that you to give up all animal foods to save ourselves, to save the animals, to save the planet. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm clearly saying that. This is what we have to do. Any compromise you make is a compromise against Mother Earth. If you include dairy products, you include, you know, anything but a starch-centered diet. You're putting a strain on this planet that it does not need. So join me. I mean, stand up and say, I am vegan. I eat no animal foods. And better yet, I know about a healthy vegan diet. It's not Cokes and potato chips. It's rice, corn, potatoes, and green and yellow vegetables. Anyways, the first attempt to punch through this barrier, this great wall separating us from ignorance, will be January 9th, 2021, when we put on the first McDougal conference on how a vegan diet has a chance of saving humanity. And until you understand the misinformation that uh, surrounds the protein issue, you don't stand a chance. So let's get on with the lecture. Dr. McDougal, where is this conference taking place? And can oh, anyone- Thank you very much for saying it. How do you sign up? I didn't tell you. <clears throat> Just like I didn't tell you how you sign up for the 12 day live-in program or not live-in, but uh, non-live-in program. Well, in a way it's a live-in because they're living in their house. They are. And you know, so much, as you well know, AJ, I mean, we sat and talked a few minutes before we started this conference. It's been such a plus as far as communication goes to deliver the message in, over the internet. Yeah, this is going to be an internet conference. How much is it going to cost? Well, the same amount as planet Earth is charging me. <laughs> nothing. Costs nothing. I mean, my foundation, the McDougal Research and Education Foundation, is paying for it, paying the speakers, uh, paying the technicians. You know, we hope to put on a fairly good quality presentation. So, yeah, it's coming from the McDougal Research and Education Foundation, which I hope you donated to. Uh, that's a 501c3 tax deductible foundation that we've been running for about 15 years. Fully approved foundation, done a lot of good. And right now it's trying to do education, not only to save people's individual lives, but to save the big one. Yeah, the one that we're gonna be living on in 20 years or 30 years or hopefully 50 years. So help, you know, any contribution you can make, you know, you wanna tell me something positive or negative, I don't care. I don't care what you say in terms of, uh, of uh, making me feel better. Uh, this is not a popularity contest. So anything you can do to help me or deliver the message more effectively, please do. Let's get on with the lecture on protein, I think. Part one. And uh, you can make some contributions as we go along or uh, as we finish up. All right. How's that, uh, AJ? We, uh, not quite good enough, is it? Yeah, just almost. All right. How's that? Perfect now. All right. Dr. McDougall slays king protein. Ha. Huh. You know, out of all of the nutritional elements that I could possibly mention that people have misinformation on that really counts, it's the misinformation on protein. I mean, that's the thing we got to solve first. We can solve the idea that starches are fattening, not true. Or you need to eat fats and oils to lubricate your joints, not true. You know, it's, uh, we got a lot of misinformation to straighten out here. But uh, most important is the idea that we need to eat protein to be healthy. Why were we taught that? Why were we taught we needed to be pro eat protein to be healthy? You know, I, I can relate to, to what came out of my childhood experiences, and that was my mother was raised during the Great Depression, and she lived in a, in a borrowed home with her family. Otherwise, she'd have been a street person. Yeah, she'd have been living, if she'd have had a tent, you know, on the street, but... Due to the uh, 
the generosity of her landlord, her parents were able to stay in their home. They lived on, on potatoes and turnips. And my mother promised herself that she'd ne never let her children suffer like she did, living in such austere times on the McDougal diet. Yeah, same foods that we eat today. No, I didn't suffer from the, I, the problems that my mother suffered from. I suffer from problems of overnutrition. And a key focus in that education on overnutrition is you've got to get enough protein. Why is it so important? It's because this is the center of your nutritional education through many, many of your crucial health experiences. Like for example, say you're a family, okay? Man and a wife, loving relationship, 30 years, like this man a lot, has a heart attack. Go to the doctor, doctor recommends all kinds of things. Of course, heart surgery and heart casts and the usual stuff. And when you get around to the long-term benefits, the wife says, well, you know, I've heard about this vegetarian, maybe this vegan diet. And when we go home, that's what I'm going to do is I, I'm going to help save my husband's life by putting us on a vegetarian vegan diet. And the doctor says, you can't do that, ma'am. You'll become protein deficient. Plants are missing amino acids. You want to make your husband a frail mess? He won't live long enough to have his next heart attack if you put him on this vegetarian diet. Or your child's sick with some terrible allergy problems and you tell the doctor, hey, I want to take my little baby off of the cow's milk, get rid of the snotty nose, the ear infections, the asthma. Oh, ma'am, you can't do that. It's necessary to have cow's milk, not only for protein, but also for calcium. So you effectively can't take care of your cells and your family unless you have correct information. And it is vital. We're talking about life and death situations to have this information at hand. And most importantly, so that you can repeat it to interested family members and community members. The microanatomy of protein is amino acids. Amino acids are the building blocks of protein. There are 20 different amino acids in nature. Some people say 22, but let's just say 20 amino acids in nature. The human being can make uh, 12 of these amino acids, but we can't make eight of them. And so we call these eight, eight essential amino acids because they must come from the food. We cannot make them. But the other 12 we can make from different components. And amino acids have something characteristic about them, and that is that they contain a nitrogen atom. All of them do. That's characteristic of an amino acid. That's characteristic of protein is to have an element called nitrogen. And along with that, they also have carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen. And a few special amino acids have a sulfur atom or sulfur element. Now elements you have to realize cannot be created or destroyed. So they occur in nature and we must utilize them from nature. The uh, special sulfur containing amino acids that I wanna to talk to you about over the next few minutes are methionine and cysteine. And I want you to remember that. These are the two sulfur containing amino acids. Remember, people can make 12 of the essential amino acids, but not eight. They're making 12 of the amino acids, which are not essential, but not the eight that are considered essential. And then what happens is these amino acids are rearranged in different sequences to make millions and trillions of different kinds of proteins. Just like you can take the same 26 letters of an alphabet and rearrange them into an entire dictionary. You can take the 20 amino acids that are found in nature and rearrange them into all proteins found in nature, all proteins in elm trees, all proteins in elephants, mosquitoes, all proteins in nature are formed by the same 20 amino acids rearranging in different sequence like the letters rearranged to form the words in a dictionary. Now, these kinds of proteins that are formed as a result of synthesizing amino acids into long chains, long winding chains and structures, uh, all kinds of proteins are made. Proteins for digestion, such as lactase. Proteins for structure, such as collagen and muscle tissues. Uh, proteins for eye pigment, uh, various kinds of proteins that, that determine the metabolism of the body, such as insulin. 
you live or die based upon whether or not you have insulin. And there are different kinds of proteins that are made that are antibacterial. Proteins carry around the iron uh, in your blood to oxygenate your blood and all of your tissues. And proteins are involved in the uh, replication of DNA. As a matter of fact, DNA turns to RNA, which turns to proteins. It's a whole sequence. That if you're interested in biochemistry, you might get involved in. And don't forget, proteins are also an important component of our nervous system, or excuse me, our immune system, which we're so busy keeping healthy these days to fend off serious viruses like COVID-19. So we got to keep those, uh, those immune, immune systems working well. And as I've discussed with you, if you want to have a healthy working immune system that prevents serious progression to serious diseases of any kind, chronic or acute, you must keep that immune system healthy. Let's focus on some of the foods. I can talk about protein and fats and carbohydrates all day long, but we really want to talk about the foods they translate into. There's a marketing technique called unique positioning. And what a, a particular industry does is it finds something out about its product that is unique. And then it advertises this unique characteristics to its customer. Like for example, certain cars get a great amount of mileage. Well, okay, they may get a great amount of mileage because they're lightweight and they're built with flimsy materials. So what do they advertise? They advertise the 58 miles per gallon. They don't ever advertise the fact that you're gonna get killed in the slightest auto accident. So it is the obligation of various industries to find something unique about their product, true or not true, important or not important, and to impress upon the consumer that this is why they must buy their product. When it comes to protein, there are various foods to mention, but most synonymous with protein is meat. Yeah, people will talk about dairy products and protein, sure. Mostly they focus on calcium. And they'll talk about fishy meat. But most, most commonly they talk about omega-3 fats. The unique positioning goes to meat when it comes to protein. That's the big sales pitch. And so I'll focus a lot on meat in my discussion about protein. Meat production has gone up uh, worldwide in various countries between 19, 1961 and 2018. We see that the world uh, supply of meat products has increased at least threefold. And some of the biggest increases have come in the third world countries where they have become wealthy enough through industrial revolution and uh, the harnessing of fossil fuels to make everybody rich enough to eat like a king and a queen. As far as selling products in the stores, uh, protein has been a major focus of attention with uh, $60 million spent in 2008 on protein containing foods that increases to 1.1 billion in 2013 and 1.6 billion to 2018. What I'm trying to tell you is it's a growing concept, the idea that we need to get more protein. And I don't know how we're gonna stop it except by the correct information that follows. Meat is food poison. Yes, it is. By all kinds of means, meat kills. Now you may say, oh, he's just using this type of, this type of verbiage to cause people to react, calling it poison. What is poison? The definition of a poison is a substance that is capable of causing the illness or death of a living organism when consumed. A substance with an inherent property that tends to destroy life and impair health. What would you call meat but a poison? This is the correct terminology. It poisons in various ways, and you've known about these ways even before you met me. Your animal products in particular, we're talking about meats are high calorie, high fat, high in saturated fat, which uh, damages the arteries, giving you strokes and heart attacks and impotence. High in protein, which leads to osteoporosis, kidney damage, stones, high in acid, which leads to osteoporosis and stones. High cholesterol, which helps damage the arteries. High in iron, which also leads to hardening of the arteries. No dietary fibers, so no dietary, only fiber is present in plants. No dietary fiber, virtually no carbohydrate, no calcium, no vitamin C. I mean, it is a deficient food that on the other side of the coin is toxic. Why do people eat it? 
well, it's a food of status, bringing home the bacon. When I talk about meat, you may want to uh, dissect meat into different groups and you know, cause one meat in your mind to be healthier than another meat. Basically, they're all the same. They're all muscles. Whether the meat happens to come from a pig's leg or a fish tail or a chicken wing or a cow arm, these are all muscles. These are instruments of mobility. They are the same. A muscle is a muscle is a muscle is a muscle is a muscle. And you can clearly tell the difference between the vegetable foods that you eat and I eat. Well, if you're looking for better health by switching from red muscle to white muscle, look again. You're gonna see virtually no change at all. No change in the amount of constipation, obesity, blood cholesterol levels. Yeah. As a matter of fact, when you consume fish and chicken based upon calories, you end up uh, consuming more cholesterol. I'm talking about based on calories versus based on weight. You end up consuming more cholesterol than you do in beef and pork and raising your blood cholesterol higher with fish and chicken than you would with beef and pork. But the relevance here is that all the same, you're not gonna get good health by switching from one kind of muscle to another. One of the uh, qualities and characteristics I'd like to talk to you about in terms of animal foods, particularly meat products, muscle products, is their characteristic of containing sulfur, sulfur laden amino acids. Methionine and cysteine are the two of the 20 sulfur, 20 amino acids that are sulfur containing. Remember there are 20 essential or 20 amino acids, eight are essential, 12 we can make, and two of them contain sulfur. Well, this sulfur has some particular characteristics that we're gonna talk about uh, in this lecture and the next one to follow that are particularly toxic to the body. If you take a look at the sulfur content of various foods, and take a minute to look at that. You will see that some of your fish have the highest contents of sulfur of any of the mussels. Sulfur, let's, let's dwell upon sulfur for a minute because we're gonna be talking about sulfur during this lecture and the next. Uh, sulfur has uh, an easy ability to recognize when, it, when it's present in large amounts of food because it stinks. Uh, you think about the, uh, the sulfur pits at Yosemite National Park or her rotten eggs or the smell of fish, a fishy smell. This sulfur is also quite toxic in the terms of it hurts the bones by providing an acidic effect. You see, sulfur containing amino acids are very powerful acids. They break down to sulfuric acid. And that acid has to be metabolized by the body and in the process of doing so, it, uh, it removes the calcium and the structure from the bones and gives you weak bones or osteoporosis. And these bone structures, they recalcify in the kidneys and give you kidney stones. Almost all kidney stones in our society are based on calcium. Sulfur containing amino acids are particularly toxic to the bowel and they're believed to be part of the foundation of the irritation that results in serious inflammatory problems called inflammatory bowel disease or Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. We know from uh, scientific experiments that sulfur restriction prolongs life. Sulfur stinks, as we just talked about, and your body odor, all the way from your bad breath to your stink under your armpits to your bad farts, is determined largely by the sulfur content of the food that you eat. And sulfur is particularly damaging to the arteries. We have new research that talks about how sulfur containing amino acids raise the homocysteine levels, which end up giving you more heart attacks, more strokes, more artery disease in general. So we wanna give up the meats and we wanna give up it not only for our own health, but also for planet earth Dairy products, well, dairy products, as we've talked about many times, I'd like to emphasize again, are just liquid meat. They're just liquid meat. If you take a look and you compare the, the chuck beef, for example, with cheddar cheese, you see that they're basically the same amount of calories, the same amount of protein, same amount of carbohydrate, virtually none, no fiber. 
laden with cholesterol. Dairy products are just liquid meat. So we want to ask the government to get those out of our out of our society too. But we have some big changes to make in 2021. Don't we straighten out our environment? Oh, we have so many big things to do. Eggs, also a high protein food, very rich food. I've always found eggs kind of interesting. And of course we include this discussion on protein. We have to talk about eggs. Not only are they high in sulfur, but uh, they're high in cholesterol. Think about an egg for a minute. An egg is a package that weighs about one and a half ounces that's created as a consequence of the joining of a cock sperm and a, hexo egg, a hen's ovum. And the result is the growth of feathers and beaks and legs and scales and bones and into a complete chicken. So this little package all self-contained, this egg must contain an assortment of abundant nutrients. That's why they describe eggs as one of nature's most perfect foods. But the problem is it's too much of a good thing. And people are dying from overnutrition, not undernutrition. And so bragging that uh, that eating eggs or the resulting chicken or the uh, similar pigs and cows and so on are somehow good for you. It's just plain and simple, not true. Yeah, they're full of nutrients, excess nutrients. And the ones that your mother may have focused on, just like my mother focused on, because she went through these tough times of deformation during the during the, the difficult years of uh, fall of the stock market and depression and so on that she went through as a child. So yeah, lots of calcium, lots of protein, but you don't know anybody that has protein or calcium deficiency, do you? To further add to the insult and injury as far as what comes with protein, we have a whole segment of evil people out there recommending these low carb, high protein diets. And yeah, they cause you to get sick enough to lose some weight. You do. Yeah, you do. You lose a lot of water, maybe eight, 10 pounds the first week you go on these high protein, low carb diets. Sure you do. Yeah, you get constipated. Yeah, you have very bad breath, which is reported in the uh, scientific reports on these high protein, low carb diets. But you're willing to suffer this sickness, sickness. Boy, oh boy, you must be willing to go through a lot to follow these high protein, low carb diets based upon the very foods that I just talked to you about, the fish, the cheese, the beef, the pork, the chicken, the eggs. Yeah, they're high protein, but that's highly damaging. Now I have to mention to you before I go on with the further discussion is that animal proteins are different than plant proteins. They affect the body differently. For one thing is that uh, plant proteins contain many fewer sulfur-containing amino acids, whereas animal proteins are loaded with sulfur-containing amino acids that we talked about. The animal protein sources you have to realize are things that are loaded with cholesterol, fat, contamination. We're talking about the whole package here. We're talking about the chicken leg, the cow leg, the fish tail, et cetera. You know, you can't isolate out the, just the protein Along with that protein in animal foods comes a whole bunch of other nasty ingredients. Whereas plants are loaded with really, really health supporting ingredients like carbohydrates, vitamins, minerals, fighters, fibers and phytates and so on. So yes, there is a distinction between plant protein and animal protein. Animal protein is much, much more toxic, raises cholesterol higher, blood sugar higher, changes the microflora of the gut, overworks the kidneys and the liver, Yes, and it's loaded with these sulfur-containing amino acids. So let's add some, some saving grace to plant proteins when I talk about the harm of protein and the need for protein. By the way, plant protein, when it comes to supplying sufficiency, is as good as animal proteins. In fact, better. When it comes to damage, it's the animal proteins that have it hands down over plant proteins. Where do you get your protein? Friends are gonna ask you, where do you get your protein? Well, the first thing they're gonna think about is the protein deficient people from all over the world, the millions and millions of people that are suffering from kwashiorkor. 
which folk scientists try and distinguish from marasmus. Marasmus is supposed to be due just to general starvation. Somehow kwashiorkor is due to a special kind of starvation. I think when starving people are starving, they're starving. I mean, they have no food. Somehow there's an idea that there are starving people that are living on white sugar and white flour, and they have all the other necessary ingredients to stay healthy and alive, but protein, and they get kwashiorkor. This is plain and simple, not true, folks. Kwashiorkor is due to starvation. Overall starvation. People are deficient in everything. Calories, vitamins, minerals, calcium, fiber, food. And they get kwashiorkor and marasmus or whatever you want to call it. And when these young children are found and treated, they're treated with their natural diets, their cassava, which is very low in protein, potatoes and other root vegetables, various kinds of grains. And that's how they're nourished back to excellent health in the few foolish times when these children were treated with diets high in dairy products, for example, they suffered from profound diarrhea, fluid loss and death. It didn't take long for, for researchers and uh, aid people to figure out that what you need to do is feed people their native foods in Africa, Asia, South America and other parts of the world. You feed them rice and corn and potatoes and even cassava, which is noted for being relatively low in protein, but sufficient to bring these children back to excellent health without hurting them. The next bit of information that may have caused <clears throat> Uh, your your uh, knowledgeable friends, relatives, in-laws, scientists, doctors, etc., to come to the conclusion that plants just plain and simple aren't adequate. It's work done by Osborne and Mendel back in 1917. Osborne and Mendel did some classic work on rats. They took rats and they fed them plant protein and found out that the rats didn't grow very well. So they called that class B or inferior protein. And I tell you, as a child, in elementary school, I learned about class B and inferior proteins, and I learned that they were plants. And then they put a little meat in the diet of these growing rats, and they found out that they grew great when you add a little bit of meat to a rat's diet. So they concluded that rats need animal protein. Oh, wait a minute. No, they concluded people needed rat protein, needed animal protein, just like rats. They concluded people are rats. Well, that's the only conclusion you can make because, because uh, yes, you need to have animal protein or a mixed diet to grow good rats, but not so with people. Well, this kind of misinformation, either delving from uh, misguided promoters of high protein diets or incomplete research or fear uh, that somehow less privileged people and their problems may threaten our lives has resulted in public policy that plants are inadequate. All kinds of organizations have come out and made recommendations not to eat plant foods as a sole source of nutrients, particularly when it comes to protein and amino acids, because they are inadequate. For example, Harvard Public School in 2011 said other protein sources lack one or more amino acids the body can't make from scratch or create by modifying another amino acid. They're called incomplete proteins. Yeah, that was back in 2011 and 2001. The Nutrition Committee for the American Heart Association said although plant proteins form a large part of the human diet, most are deficient in one or more essential amino acids and are therefore regarded as incomplete. Now I want you to remember these two organizations. Harvard and the American Heart Association. And there are all kinds of other organizations. If you do a search on the internet and you look for incomplete proteins or plant proteins or amino acids, or stuff, you'll find this as being the prevalent understanding is that plants are inadequate, they're inferior. Yeah. For example, right now, the Harvard Health Publishing, Harvard School of Public Health says, Incomplete proteins such as vegetables, greens, and nuts are lower in essential amino acids, but you can combine them to create a complement of protein that's, that, that do provide enough essential amino acids. Do, do you see what they're saying? Do you see that if you go to the hospital with your lovely spouse and 
you lay in there and he or she's having a heart attack and you tell the doc, look, I don't want my loved one to suffer anymore with heart disease or die or me to suffer, the family to suffer. And I'm going to change you and I'm going to change our family to a vegan or vegetarian diet, preferably a starch-based diet with fruits and vegetables, the McDougal diet, of course. And the doctor responds to you based upon Harvard and the American Heart Association, Tufts and other prominent researchers and prominent institutions all over the world. They tell you, they back your doctor and they say, you can't do this. What if they're wrong? What is their completely, what if the concept of protein is completely incorrect? What if this desire for high protein foods is not only keeping you and your family sick, but it's also standing in the way of saving the planet? What if? You see, the stakes are a lot higher than you might have expected. Well, let's uh, talk about how much milk, how much protein the human being needs and how we get those amino acids. Nature is kind, nature is smart, nature is unflawing, no question about it. And uh, one of nature's design is a creature called a mammal. A characteristic of a mammal is that they're warm blooded, they got fur, and most importantly, they make milk for their young. They make milk, mammal, mammary gland. Scientists look at the milk of various mammals to determine what the adult might need based upon the requirements of the infant. That's where they start looking. If you look at the protein content of various mammalian milks based upon their rate of growth, you'll see they vary to meet the needs of that animal. For example, the human being, when it comes to cow's milk, 100 grams of cow's milk, needs 1.2 grams. Well, the human being doubles in size in about three months, maybe six. Slow rate of growth, becomes an adult at 17 years of age. Horses, they grow much faster. They grow to double, they double in size in 60 days. Well, they need more protein. They need more building blocks. And a cow, three times the, the rate of growth, three times the protein requirement. In the milk, in the milk. And rats require 11 times as much protein to build an adult rat, which takes about four to five months and they double in size in four and a half days. Yeah, nature supplies her milk for the appropriate specific uh, species that it's trying to support. Nature doesn't make mistakes. And so goes the other ingredients necessary for the growth needs of a particular animal, particularly in youth, they have enough calcium plenty of phosphorus, sodium, potassium, and all the other nutrients. It has to be ideal or this mammalian species would not survive. And we go on trips to uh, various parts of the world, or at least used to when traveling was easier. And one of the things that we'd go to, one of the trips we'd take is to Hawaii. And on our trip, one of the things that I would do every day along with Mary is we go on a catamaran trip out to see these mammals. And these mammals have a very interesting story. Of course, they're very many ton animals. And they uh, swim all the way from Alaska, pregnant, down to Hawaii, and they birth, and they mate. And they supply this calf all the nutrients that he or she may need for the trip back up to Alaska to get more food. And the mother doesn't eat anywhere along the way. Well, you would expect her milk to support the needs of that particular infant, wouldn't you? And so you find this milk very high in fat and protein, much more so than the needs for humans. We don't have to make that long trip in that cold water. The calf does, the whale calf does. And so it contains four times as much protein no, eight times that of human milk and four times as much cow's milk to support that particular need, as well as just being loaded with fat, which is concentrated energy to support that travel all the way from Hawaii to Alaska. So how about uh, Mother Nature when it came to human beings? Do you think that she was kind? Do you think she was appropriate? 
he thinks you made a right choice, or maybe there's something wrong with human mother's breast milk. Maybe the dairy industry ought to weigh in on that one. Well, of course, mother's milk is perfect. It's delivered in a latchable container. Think about that. That provides a fluid of perfect temperature with adequate nutrients that never spoils. If it's particularly hot a certain day, the milk will contain more water. If the child needs more nutrients that particular day, there'll be less water in the mother's milk. The milk makes appropriate antibacterial, antimicrobial materials that take and, and fight off infections in the infant. And mother's immune system communicates with that milk. She puts hormones in her milk that uh, help the growth to be normal. And it's always affordable. In fact, you may consider it cost free. And matter of fact, you may, if you take into consideration everything, you might consider his mother's milk a financial advantage for the whole family. Oh, just one more side note. <clears throat> and that is, and I'd only tell this crowd that, that is so that I often hear. Uh, people say it doesn't make any difference when it comes to the infant. Uh, what, what's the difference between uh, a, uh, an infant uh, getting its nourishment off of a formula versus a mother's breast? No psychological changes, no emotional disturbances. And I sure hope that's the case. Well, my challenge to anybody who says that, particularly any, any particular who's man who's in a loving relationship or a woman who's in a loving relationship with a person who happens to contain the latchable instrument is that instead tonight, what you do is curl up with a glass bottle and a rubber nipple and see how comforting that is. Well, you're not gonna do that, of course. All right. Uh, we know also that you can raise infants that have been orphaned uh, who have no mothers, no source of, of sisters or, or friends or so on that would take over the lactation experience for a mother who couldn't, who couldn't breastfeed, which sometimes occurs. There's a whole discussion on what you, I think you should do if you're not able to breastfeed, and this does occur. It's in my, on my website under the section on children and pregnancy on what children should eat and how you feed a child that, should, that cannot have the advantage of this natural latchable apparatus called a breast. And put them on potatoes, they can get the protein from potatoes and the infant can grow normally. Protein intake varies worldwide. Uh, in Western countries, we have very large amounts of protein intake. It's worshiped in our society. Uh, 100 to 160 grams a day is typical. Low carb dieters like people on the Atkins diet 200 to 400 grams a day, rural Africa and Asia, 40 to 60 grams a day. And my recommendation is around 30 to 80 grams a day. What are the protein needs? The real protein needs of the human being. Let's let me summarize it for a minute for you. Your losses of protein, say based upon your skin or your gut cells or the hair that falls off, fingernails, toenails, et cetera, that is replaced by as little as three grams of protein a day. You're talking about one-tenth of an ounce of protein a day. The minimum requirement determined by scientific experiments for human beings is 20 to 30 grams a day, which represents four to 5% of the calorie intake. During the most rapid time of growth in the human being's life when the baby is growing on breast milk, the ideal diet is about 5% protein. The Asian diet where people used to avoid between, before 1980, the disease is common to Western civilization. No heart disease, no breast cancer, no colon cancer, no prostate cancer. Back in those days, the typical Asian diet based upon at least 90% rice, that Asian diet was only eight to 14% protein based on rice and vegetables and most times no dairy and many times very little meat, other animal foods. The McDougall diet is consistent with the Asian diet 35 to 75 grams of protein a day, 7 to 15% of your calorie intake. The typical Western diet, about twice as high. Diets like the Zone diet, which were very popular, 30% protein, South Beach, 30 to 50% protein. 
and the Atkins diet, you can make it as high as 70% of the calories from protein. We're going to talk about the damages uh, caused by excess protein during the next lecture. So how do we get the requirements for our current protein recommendations, which are the more the better? Well, this kind of came from work done in the 1800s, particularly by Atwater and Voigt, Carl Voigt. He's a very famous guy. Back then, everybody knew Voigt. He was a German physiologist, and uh, he made recommendations on what people should eat, particularly the protein requirements. And most of the people in those days came along with Voigt's recommendation. They didn't do any experiments, none at all. They came to a conclusion based on observations. The observation that they made was that if people had enough money to afford to, they would naturally choose the right foods. They have this innate ability to make the right choices, the right amount of protein, fat, et cetera. What they're talking about is a bigotry that resides in maybe better educated people, that puts down people with less of an education, that says that their diet, it has to be inferior to mine because after all, I went to college, I got a job, I'm a soldier, I'm a worker, which are the people that uh, that Voigt was observing. I must be better than those people who work in the fields. They didn't take into consideration the fact that the Asian and African population live on half as much protein. And there, there were many vegetarians, vegans at that time that were surviving alive on half as much protein as Voigt and Atwater and others recommended at that time. So observations uh, that many people could make were in complete contrast to what was the common knowledge then. And folks, I wanna tell you is the common knowledge now. <laughs> All right, let's see. Okay, there we go. The common knowledge now. So, uh, and at that time, you have to understand, the, the amount of food in a person's diet was really important. It represented half their income. So Carl Atwater, he was one of the early nutritionists, and like many of them, they believe that flesh makes flesh. In other words, if you eat more meat, you make more muscle. And of course, people wanted more muscle. What would follow is if you eat more bones, you grow more skeleton. You eat more brains, you get smarter. You eat testicles, at, well, we won't go there. Uh, Voigt believed that people who have sufficient income could afford any choice. They would choose the right thing. Well, take a look at what people do in terms of choosing the right thing based upon natural instinct. They end up choosing a diet that sets them up for obesity, diabetes, heart disease, and cancer. So much for innate knowledge. Well, that kind of stopped in Denmark when the very famous nutritionist, uh, Mikhail Hinhidi, he became prominent during World War I when he changed the entire diet of the Danish people, three million people, to a near vegan diet during World War I to prevent starvation due to the blockade that occurred as a result of World War I and a blockade set up by the British in the North Sea. 40,000 Germans starved because they kept with a reasonable diet, the basic four. But Hinhidi, his work had told him, first of all, that protein was not anything you had to worry about. There's no such thing as protein requirements that, that can be, cannot be met. And he convinced the Danish government to change the diet of the Danes over a three year, year period of time and three million Danes did, they switched to eating the animal foods, the soybeans, the potatoes, the grains that the animals were previously eating and stopped eating the animals. Well, at that time, Mikhail Heenhidi, he'd be working with various subjects. For example, here's a guy named Madison who ate a diet of, of basically potatoes. And as he had stated many, many times and his colleagues knew so well, the minimum need for protein was so low for man that it could not be reached. So why even think about it? Well, I'll tell you why you think about it today because high protein foods are high profit foods. Russell Henry Chittenden, very uh, important researcher, he's at Yale University. 
And uh, he was known as the father of uh, American biochemistry. Uh, Dr. Chittenden, he, he was uh, worried about his own personal health. And he also questioned the work done by Carl Voigt and other quote experts uh, stating that you need to eat all this meat in the diet to be healthy. He was in, uh, he understood the, the conflicting observations that made this not true. And so he started to test. And he did, uh, he did experiments where uh, he tested at, university, at Yale University the idea that we need to have this high protein diet. And he did scientific experiments where he checked the urine and did careful biochemical histories on these people. One of the interesting statements that came from Chittenden was, we are all creatures of habit and our palates are pleasantly excited by rich animal foods with their high content of protein. And we may well question whether our dietetic habits are not based more upon the dietetics of our palate than upon scientific reasoning and true physiologic needs. Well, you know, uh, Chidna was a really smart guy and uh, he questioned Voigt as far as cause and effect goes. Uh, he questioned whether or not people who were uh, better educated made better choices or it was just that people who were better educated made more money were able to make choices of rich foods. And so he started doing experiments. He did the first experiment on himself and that experiment, because he had, was, was careful, involved himself and what he did was he cut his protein intake in half, you know, basically cut out the animal foods and his sore knees went away and his nauseous feeling that he had every day went away and he lost about 30 pounds. And, uh, you know, after he survived well on this kind of what was considered a dangerous diet at that time, he decided he was going to extend his experiment and he asked five of his Yale faculty whether or not they would join him. And they followed the similar kind of diet. They dropped their protein intake from, say, 120 grams to 60 grams a day, and they all thrived. And then they took 13 hospital corps workers who were active at least one day a week. They were physically active at least one day a week. They put them on this kind of diet. And what happened is they thrived. And then he took eight Yale student athletes. And overall, they increased their athletic performance by 35%. He uh, wrote his basic understanding in a book called Physiological Economy and Nutrition. And the idea that the body is not wasteful. The idea is that the body makes most efficient use of everything that you give it. And the idea of giving excess protein to the body to make it healthier just did not make sense to him at all. And his studies showed that for, clear, for, for certain that it didn't make any sense. The uh, next important person that came along was William Rose. And I have to tell you a personal thing is um, one of my patients, one of my followers in the early 1980s met William Rose in Chicago. And William Rose is one of my heroes to say the least. He did all the basic work on protein requirements. And he showed William Rose a, a copy of my book and and this follower took a picture of William Rose holding my book. And he said, he said, William Rose said about Dr. McDougall, he says that this diet just proves the human body will live on almost anything. I don't think that was a compliment. But anyway, I did have some contact with William Rose. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> William Rose, uh, he did experiments and he published uh, 13 or 17 scientific papers in the uh, Journal of Biochemistry, they're considered classics. He discovered the last two of the essential amino acids of the eight essential amino acids. He discovered the last two. And then he did experiments that were very detailed. He enrolled his students who wanted to get involved in his studies because they knew that they'd become famous. Throughout history, they'd become famous because their names would be in the scientific papers. And of course, they wanted to make a contribution to science. And so they went through various experiments that William Rose designed that were done in a metabolic world where he determined exactly what these people ate. The first thing he did is he determined how much protein people needed. 
And he determined that they needed about 20 to 30 grams a day. Then what he did is he took and made a, a mixture that was made of corn maize. In fact, it was deep, deep protein corn maize. They took all the protein out of it. And they put some vitamins and minerals back in and, you know, they, they, they added an extra candy supplement that said had extra vitamins and minerals and so on. And they would take one of the essential amino acids out of the mixture. They would take, you know, essentially all the amino acids out of the mixture and see what happened. And what they found was that the human being could make 12 of the, of the 20 amino acids. So 12 were not essential for them. And by the way, this is two better than a rat. Okay, we can make 12, a rat can only make 10. So uh, <clears throat> we could make uh, these 12 amino acids, so they didn't have to be included in the diet. That was determined by adding and subtracting to the mixture, the non-essential amino acids. And then what they did is they took the essential, eight essential amino acids that you had to get from the diet, and they reduced the amount given to the subject until they developed extreme fatigue. They were unable to go on and carry the experiment. They felt irritable, anxious. They demanded that they get their diet fixed again because they were under so much distress. And by this means, they determined the minimum amino acid requirements. If you look at this chart, which appears in the McDougall plan, it's the only place you'll find it. I published it 40 years ago. If you look at this chart, you will see Rose's minimum requirements for each of the essential amino acids. And then what Rose did is in the second column, he doubled the minimum requirements, which by the way, were the most any single subject required in the experiment. Let me say that again. Rose's minimum requirement was the most any subject required in the experiment, and then he doubled it and made a recommended requirement. And what you'll notice is that each and every starch and vegetable exceeds Rose's recommended requirement, which is twice as minimum, which is the maximum of any subject required. And any, any plant food, any whole plant food meets these, these particular requirements. Well, this all worked out until Francis Moore-Lepay showed up, which by the way, Francis Moore-Lepay, I had her on my radio show one time, very lovely person, made a, huge positive contribution to the welfare of the planet and welfare of human beings. So I don't mean this to take away from her overall wonderful contribution. And that is when she wrote the book, Diet for a Small Planet, which explained to us what big trouble we're in because of our fixation on eating a high animal food diet. But she also incorporated the misunderstandings of Voigt and Osborne and Mendel and the ignorant people at Yale and Harvard, et cetera. She also incorporated those ideas into her basic book, which told us that we had to complement amino acids. You couldn't get all the essential amino acids from plants, but you could by mixing and matching. Well, I had her on my radio show about 10 years later when she wrote a book called The 10 Year Anniversary in 1981, and she apologized. Well, you know what, like I say, her overall contribution was so positive. And if you understand that we do make mistakes and if we get them right, that's a very noble thing to do and correct our misunderstandings. Let's uh, talk about one of the people who has serious misunderstanding. Remember I told you Harvard still teaches the old concepts. Well, the American Heart Association doesn't teach the old concepts anymore. And they stopped doing this based upon an interaction that we had in 2001. The American Heart Association wrote an important long overdue paper, actually too little too late, that condemned low carbohydrate Atkins kind of diets. And in this particular paper, a review of the subject is these diets are dangerous. They don't meet our nutritional needs. They may lead to heart, kidney, bone, and liver problems. That's good, that's important. I read this paper with enthusiasm in 2001 until I got to the second page. And that second page contained an often quoted but incorrect statement. And that I told them about when I wrote them a letter to the editor in June of 2002. I said in my letter to the editor, what you see a copy of right here, what you can get by going to the internet. Your paper, condemning low carbohydrate diets 
contains an often quoted but incorrect information about the adequacy of animal amino acids found in plant foods. This report states, although plant proteins form a large part of a human diet, most are deficient in one or more essential amino acids, therefore regarded as incomplete. Excuse me. I wrote uh, Barbara Howard, who's the head of kids committee and the whole committee, a letter. I said, hey, guys, that's not what the scientific research says. And besides that, by you making such a statement, people don't have the opportunity to make correct medical and nutritional decisions for them and their family or the community. I told him this is important. Well, Barbara Howard, she wrote back, and you see her letter to the editor on this particular page. So it must be remembered that amino acid content in most plant foods is more limited in amount per serving than that of animal sources. Thus, it is difficult to maintain essential amino acids at optimum quantity and distribution. That's another more flowery BS way of saying the same thing. Well, I wrote him back. <clears throat> And uh, they said, look, McDougal, you know, we've kind of had enough of you. We'll publish your, your retort online, but not in our hard medical journal called Circulation. We won't give you that opportunity, is what they basically said. And I said, yes, you will. As you're going to put it in hard print so that people can see it five years from now, 10 years from now, 100 years from now what I wrote about the nutrition committee and the incorrect information that you provide. So they finally did. They finally printed my letter and here it is. My letter says that I want you to grant me the courtesy of professional and honest answer by showing me I am incorrect, by citing scientific research that contradicts my position and the studies I provided. Show me the basic researches I've done for you. You could do that, that's number one. Number two is you can admit you're wrong. You have the incorrect information. Ladies and gentlemen, there's no three. It's one or two. Well, Barbara Howard, she wrote me back with plenty of scientific references. Yes, she did. Basically the ones that I gave her showing that she was wrong. And then she went on and she said in her letter, an article by Millward, and Millward, by the way, is the most respected amino acid and protein researcher in the world, summarizes 15 articles and reviews the meat and wheat debate. So 15 articles, that's 15 scientific references she's providing for me, and concludes that plant-based diets, but not one food can supply protein in a mountain quality needed. Boy, did she fisk McDougal, huh? Well, I wrote uh, Joe Millward in Surrey, England, and I sent him all the information from our debate, uh, starting with the 2001 article by the American Heart Association Nutrition Committee condemning low, pro or low carbohydrate diets. I sent him my two dollars to the editor, and I asked Dr. Millward what he thinks. I didn't hear anything from him. Nothing. I wrote him, I said, are you going to answer me? He says, I'm on vacation. So I waited a month. And I said, I don't know how long you take vacations in England, but a month is a long time for us here in America. And I really would, res I would really respect an answer from you. You're the world authority on this. And he wrote me back. He says, uh, I thought I made my position quite clear in my published papers. An article I wrote for Encyclopedia of Nutrition. Contrary to general opinion, the distinction between dietary protein sources in terms of nutrition superiority of animal over plant proteins is more difficult to demonstrate and less relevant in human nutrition. Ladies and gentlemen, Millward clearly said, this is quite distinct from the American Heart Association position in which my view is wrong. They're wrong. They're wrong. People are dying. This information is keeping your spouse, your family, your children sick. All these are decent people at the American Heart Association. And so since 2011, it's only nine years later, since 2011, what has appeared at the American Heart Association website under their discussion on vegetarian diets are the following statements. 
And you'll see those today. They've taken this position. Took 10 years to, to seek out the truth, but at least they're telling now. You don't need to eat foods from animal sources to have enough protein in your diet. Plant proteins alone will provide enough of the essential and non-essential amino acids as long as the sources of dietary protein are varied and calorie intake is high enough to meet energy needs, whole grains, legumes, vegetables, seeds and nuts all contain both essential and non-essential amino acids. You don't need to constantly combine these foods. Oh boy. But the rest of the organizations have it. Harvard hasn't. You could, go, you could spend the rest of the day looking up the statements of various respected groups, institutions, universities. Look at what they state about plant proteins and their completeness and their sufficiency. They've all got it wrong and they won't correct it. Well, human breast milk, as we talked about, is 5% protein. Our basic needs are 3% protein. The World Health Organization, they tell us that men need 5% of their diet as protein. Women, excuse me, women 5% of their diet. And pregnant women, 6% of their diet is protein. And you look at what the percent of protein that's provided by various foods. In every case, your foods exceed what the World Health Organization has recommended that people consume in terms of protein. A grave, a grave plot was discovered 1,800 years ago in Ephesus, which is now modern-day Turkey. Lots of Colosseums in that area. Great gladiatorial zone when the Romans uh, occupied this particular part of the world. And uh, at their Colosseum site, they found a grave plot. And in that grave plot, they found 60 skeletons about, about 10 years ago. And they dug these skeletons up, and they determined the first that they were male. And then, based on their tools of occupation, their swords, tridents, and shields, they quickly concluded that these were gladiators. And well, what they did is they analyzed the bones of the gladiators. And they came to a very scientific conclusion. Based upon the amino acid content of the bones, you could do this with hair also, ancient hair. They determined that the diet chronically consumed by the gladiators was a vegan diet, which is consistent with stories about the gladiators of this time, which talks about the barley men. They lived on a diet of barley and beans. Why do they live on a diet of barley and beans? It's because whoever owned them wanted them to win. And didn't really care what they ate as long as they won. And to get the most endurance and strength out of a gladiator, you need to feed them a diet based on starch, low protein. Athletes today, they know how to win. You'll find that the uh, Kenyans have won 40% of the major events over the last, well, almost 20 years. Their diet is 80% corn maize and they consume something called ugali which is cornmeal and that's clearly the secret to them winning these long endurance strenuous events their diet is 77 percent carbohydrate and 10 percent of the calories are protein so winning athletes when it comes to strength endurance they know what to eat but, you know, if you're just chasing a two-year-old around or trying to make it from office to office, you should know that to get the most endurance and energy to win every day in your family, your business, your community is with a diet that is low in protein, not high in protein, a starch-based diet, a diet without the animal foods. I have talked to you in the past about how a man and a woman who are also athletes Lived on an all potato diet for six months, and they reported at the end of six months, these athletic winners, back in 1925, a man and a woman, lived on white potatoes as their sole source of nutrients. They didn't duck tired. They were happy living on potatoes. And they were described as both physically active and in good health on a diet where the protein came from potatoes. Potatoes are 10% protein. They have twice the protein we, as human breast milk. Three times the protein is what we need. Protein is never an issue. 
He needed to know that. Shouldn't have knew that. Rose knew that. The Heart Association knows that. I know that. It's never an issue. Yet it is what all people ever talk about. A final thought on how much protein we need. And you think about this, folks. In 1981, 10 Irish prisoners starved to death. The IRA, the Irish Republic Army, in protest. One man died of a gunshot wound. The other nine starved to death. Took between 57 and 73 days. An average of 62 days to starve to death. Scientists, doctors had a chance to examine these people carefully, their nutrition makeup, their body mass makeup, et cetera. And they died when they lost 40% of their body weight, when they lost 94% of their body fat, but they'd only lost 19% of their body protein. They died of fat deficiency. They no longer had enough fat to make the coverings for the nervous system, to make the other integral parts of their body. That's why they died. So next time somebody asks you, where do you get your protein? You say, I'm not worried about my protein. I'm worried about my fat. And of course, we all know that the biggest, strongest animals that have ever walked this earth have lived on vegetarian diets. And if we're going to save these animals and we're going to save ourselves and we're going to save our planet, we must get our misunderstandings about our protein needs and then the actual harm of protein, which I'm going to talk to you about during the next lecture. We must get that straightened out. We must start telling the truth. All right. There you go. Dave. Dr. McDougall, people love your passion. They loved your lecture and they're asking, well, what about all the fake meats they have now, like Beyond Meat and, you know, Impossible Burger? Would that be a better choice? Not much. Not much. These, uh, you know, you, you can make the argument that they're a better choice in the sense that, you know, you're immediately making a positive impact on animals, which is good. Uh, the environmental implications, I think, still need to be determined, although I've heard statements that as much as a 90% reduction in environmental costs come about from these fake foods. Most concerning to me, AJ, is that nobody's going to eat them. Um, you know, they, they may be a, a, a phase for a while, just like Burger King and their vegan burger. Nobody's going to eat them. They taste terrible. And when they don't taste terrible, they taste worse. They taste like the original food. I mean, when I hear that some of these products, they put heme in them to make them look bloody. Oh, boy, I tell you, I can tell you, I wouldn't invest any money in the stock market of those companies. Nobody's going to eat them. They're costly. They're not what people want. You might as well get away from it. You might as well make a total change to the foods that really make a difference. And that's starches, vegetables, and fruits. It is so much easier to make a clear, clean, distinct change than it is to be moderate and reasonable and sensible. I never quit smoking. 20 pack years of smoking. I never quit smoking until I gave up 100%. I practiced 12 times, I can tell you that. I did everything I could. I always ran into obstacles and I learned things every time I tried and I failed. But eventually what I figured out is you just can't have one cigarette, John. You can't even have one after a year or 10 years or 40 years like it's been. You got to be 100%. It's much easier. Give up those fake foods. Don't have anything that re reminds you of what life used to be. You don't want life the way it was. You don't want to feel the way you do. You don't want to look the way you do. You don't want to live with the social responsibilities you live with. You know, take a clean break. The best diet for human beings as Chittenden found, as Hinhiti found, three million Danes, as Nathan Pritikin found, as Walter Kemter found, as I found, Neil Bernard is finding these days, Carl Elselston, Dean Ornish. There are many truth tellers out there. We have to start listening. We have to start overcoming the money. So diverting money into fake foods is not the way to go. We need to divert that money into education. 
that teaches you starches are not fatty and you can't possibly design a protein or amino acid deficient diet. No one can do it. No scientist can do it based on whole foods, based on starches, vegetables, and fruits. The science is absolutely clear. You'll be amazed when you look at the research, which is something I passionately do. You'll get away from studying all day long. You'll go, my God, I can't believe this. How in the world could they come to conclusions on information that is 180 degrees from what the science says? Well, just look at the politics today, folks. There's a whole segment of our society that doesn't care about science. I'm a scientist. I do. I'll live based on science, not your hint, hunch, not your opinion, not your bigotry like Carl Voigt. I won't live on bigotry with the attitude that somehow successful people are better people, smarter people. They're better able to choose the right nutrient content for their diet than less privileged people. Bigotry. Bigotry is based on bigotry. Golly. Dr. McDougall, there's talk about it. someday they'll be able to grow meat in labs. Do you think that would be better? No. What do you want to grow? What do you want to grow? To grow anything that looks like, what do you want to grow anything that's yellow and brown food that tastes of nothing or disgusting? You know, the only way you can eat meat now is you just have to load it with ketchup and barbecue sauce and salt and sugar and you can't eat it as it is. Why would you want to make, why would you want to grow it in a lab and eat it? Oh, the only reason. You know, just take a bunch. Let's see. What can you do? You take Dr. Go ahead. Uh, excuse me for interrupting. The, the, the only reason I would want to do that is for some of us that have pets that are carnivores, but we're ethical vegans, we would feel better. That's the only reason I would say that. You know, I, I would, I would have to give it some serious thought about the pets because <clears throat> I don't know quite how to sensitively answer that question. You know, because I know there are a lot of pet lovers out there. And, uh, you know, when I had children, I had pets too. So that's a whole different story, AJ. And I don't know. Dr. McDougall, everyone wants to know how to sign up for your January 9th global conference. Oh, well, you're going to find out on probably Monday or Tuesday. Oh, great. So yeah, next week, Monday or Tuesday, we're going to, uh, it's going to be the following Saturday. And it's going to be two part or maybe three or maybe ongoing. You know, AJ, I just want to stick my door in the opening, my foot in the door. I want to get my foot in the door. I want, I got, I got to stand up there and say what I really believe. You know, people are, people need this information. As I said, researchers, scientists, politicians that really understand what's going on, understand that we have a world that cannot be saved by improvements in transportation and energy. It can only be saved with the addition by those things alone, okay? By those things alone. It must have the addition of the change of the diet of people on this planet. So we have a great responsibility. We know that those people who know have the responsibility to do, to act. So anyway, that's how I'm getting in the door as I'm gonna stick my foot in on January 9th, 2021 in our first presentation on the environment and food. I have at least four excellent researchers, speakers from around the world. And I have about 10 of them lined up to speak to you over the next month. That's fantastic. I'll, I'll encourage everybody it's to free. sign It's free, it's gonna be absolutely, no gimmicks at all free. It's, it's, it's the McDougall Research and Education Foundation's contribution to the planet. And if you folks have not donated to that research foundation, you got some extra money left over, why not? You know, at least you know it's going to some good. Wow. Well, everybody is thanking you for this wonderful presentation. They'll look forward to part two next Friday, the same time, 9 a.m. Pacific time. Oh, good. Any and questions you have or things you'd like clarified or... You know, other, other issues, uh, you know, please write me at drmcdougall at drmcdougall.com. And uh, I'll try and clean things up for the next time I give this presentation, as well as the next presentation, which will be on the harms of high protein diets. I just showed you, I just showed you that it's impossible to design a too low protein diet. And that every effort to try fails because nature's kind. Now I'm going to show you what happens when you fool Mother Nature and you start eating like a cat as opposed to a human being. And that'll be our next lecture, AJ. 
Well, thank you so much, Dr. McDougall. And thanks to all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. A special shout out to Queen of Aries and Karen Gaylor for their super chat donation. Happy New Year, everyone. Happy New Year, Dr. McDougall, to you and Mary and your thank entire you. family. And thank you so much for everything you do and your passion. And we'll see you in 167 hours from now. Oh. Take care.